Welcome to our webinar, where we'll be talking about emergencies in coaching and having a plan. No matter what sports organization you're responsible for, it's always important to have an emergency plan for any crisis, whether it's a day-to-day -day one like a power outage at your training facility or a more serious emergency like an earthquake or a blizzard. And don't forget planning for sports injuries too, as they're actually the most common type of emergency for any association. My name is Michelle. I'm the Marketing Manager here at EPACT. I'll be your host and presenter today as we explore the types of emergencies that can occur in coaching and the ways that you can best prepare for them ahead of time, including making sure you have critical player information on hand whenever you need it the most. Before we get started, I always like to share a little more about EPACT Network in case anyone listening isn't familiar with what we do here. EPACT is an online emergency network that helps sports associations move information that's usually collected on paper medical forms, waivers, and consents into a secure cloud-based system. This helps associations meet legislative requirements around the collection and management of sensitive personal health information and provides authorized users with secure access to critical information when it's needed the most. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit our website at www.epacnetwork.com or you can connect with us directly by email or phone and I'll be sure to share our contact information at the end of the presentation. Alrighty, let's dive right in. So throughout today's session, we'll cover the following topics that I hope you'll be able to take away and implement within your association and share with your staff. So the first is we're going to be looking at the most common emergencies that coaches and athletes in any sports association may encounter. And the second one is how we can plan and prepare for those potential emergencies uh, across any sports. So let's get started with the first one. Some types of emergencies for sports associations. It's no surprise that the most common in any sport, the most common emergency in any sport, sorry, is injury. Uh, in fact, each year, young athletes visit hospital emergency rooms over a million times, which is working out to be approximately once every 25 seconds for specifically for sports-related injuries. Between 2010 and 2014, concussions for athletes under 25 rose 500%. Yet every day at practice, games, or championship events, coaches, team managers, or trainers are held responsible for the health of the players in their care. And it's not just the players who get injured. No matter what sport you coach, you may have to deal with an injury to yourself, your players, or spectators at some point. And it doesn't matter whether it's a minor or a major injury, the situation needs to be managed in a calm, focused, and deliberate manner. And as a coach, you're in charge, and you have to step up to resolve the situation for your team. So let's cover a few examples of emergencies that a sports association can encounter at any point throughout the season. So let's start with medical emergencies. This is probably the most common emergency that your sports association will encounter, and that's simply due to the nature of many sports. You have high impact sports like ice hockey and football that can lend themselves to additional injuries that might not happen in swimming, for example, but it's always good to prepare for all possibilities across any sport. And so a couple of key points here. For sports injuries that require immediate treatment, also known as acute injuries, the primary goal is to stop the activity and basically try to prevent further injury or damage, depending on what the injury is. And these types of injuries, they occur suddenly, and they generally have symptoms like pain and swelling, cuts and abrasions, fractures, sprains, or even strains, um, and concussions actually uh, fall under the acute injury uh, category as well. And with these types of injuries, it's often obvious what caused it. A wrong step can lead to a sprained ankle, or a particularly awkward collision can result in a concussion. And in those scenarios, it's really important to make a quick, correct treatment decision to support the athlete until medical help arrives, or even to support them entirely if it's a less serious injury like a cut or a scrape. And then while the most dramatic sports injuries are sudden, many sports injuries overall are gradual, and they result in aches and pains that can lead to more serious issues down the road if they're not addressed properly. Overuse injuries are really common in sports, and they're often from repetitive motion. So think about um, a pitcher throwing a baseball over and over, or a soccer player kicking a ball repeatedly at the goal or you know, at, at um, fellow teammates, um, or even that concept of pushing through the pain in, in more competitive scenarios. And to prevent those injuries from becoming a more serious problem for your athletes, where they may miss out on training or games or, unfortunately, may even stop playing entirely, it's really crucial to have a training plan so that athletes can rest properly and give their bodies time to heal. And for more serious overuse injuries, where an athlete is seeking physical therapy treatment perhaps, it's important to take that into consideration alongside any regular training they're allowed to participate in. You probably want to have a very clear return to play protocol so that they reduce the risk of re-injury or developing a chronic problem that leads to a longer recovery time. And finally, 
Medical emergencies also include conditions that are either managed ongoing um, or that have a sudden impact on an athlete, and they might not actually be related to the actual sport itself. And these are things like allergic reactions, um, and those can be anything from food to uh, environmental allergies to uh, bug bites, which is going to be applicable for sports played outside, uh, things like seizures or even asthma attacks. And as with any medical emergency, when these happen, you need to be prepared to act quickly, and ideally you'll have access to a well-stocked first aid kit or have medical help nearby. So whether it's a team, doctor, uh, or medical professional, or you're you know, on a hospital route or, or there's an emergency room nearby. And you'll also want to have the information you need ahead of time to respond to specific conditions like an allergic reaction. So for example, knowing where and how to use an EpiPen in the case of a reaction. Our next type of emergency is a, a localized one. Um, this is probably more specific. This is less specific to your team, more specific to the venue or the building um, that you may use for training purposes. Um, and it's also good to have a team plan for those times you're not in your home arena. Uh, perhaps if you're out at a tournament or you're competing elsewhere or you're in a completely different third party um, a building for, uh, you know, I don't know, a weekend competition, um, you're going to then have more of a, a team focused um, uh, plan for your emergencies. And these localized emergencies can include anything like flooding, fires, even unexpected power outages, and they're all important to prepare for as they can potentially impact the safety of your athlete, staff, and also the families of those uh, players and athletes too. This is a great opportunity to put evacuation plans into place and to adjust those for occasions when you're not on home turf. And in those scenarios, you might want to connect with facility managers in other venues to get additional information that you can include in your planning so that everyone is ready ahead of time. Next is severe weather. And while there are many weather patterns that can be expected depending on the time of year, there are a number of se severe weather incidents that can actually happen at a moment's notice. So spring and summer might see sudden thunderstorms that can cause everything from thunder and lightning to hail and heavy rainfall, which can then lead to, to localized flooding. Um, winter brings things like snowstorms, blizzards, uh, even whiteouts. Um, if you live uh, where I do in the Pacific Northwest, we tend to get our winter is really just more of a rainy season than anything else. So again, you're going to get that extra rainfall, um, again, that can lead to flooding. You can have storms and um, uh, that contribute to that as well. And then you can have unexpected weather that could occur any time throughout the year. Um, for example, like uh, strong winds uh, or even hailstorms. Um, I've seen hailstorms here that have occurred in the middle of June, which is always strange but entirely possible to happen. So those, again, can impact the sport that you're playing, the building that you're in. Um, so keep those, those kinds of um, uh, emergencies in mind, too. And then the other final kind of emergency that we're going to talk about today, for some we are, are widespread disasters. And for some re regions, the chance of a widespread disaster is a lot lower than others. Um, just based on the region itself. But there are many regions that are at risk for natural disasters, like earthquakes or hurricanes or tornadoes or wildfires, which we're seeing more of um, in recent years. And while there are often seasons for natural events like hurricanes, so for example, um, anyone living in the Atlantic region knows that the Atlantic hurricane season runs from June to November, um, whereas on the West Coast or the Pacific Coast here, uh, wildfire season tends to happen during the summer months. Um, they may start a little earlier or a little later, again, depending on the exact region, but those are generally when those wildfires tend to happen. Of course, wildfires can also happen any time of the year, um, but that tends to be like their biggest season. Um, however, things like earthquakes don't have a season. They're not predictable, and they can happen at any time. Um, and then again, if you're in somewhere like the Pacific Northwest, so a coastal earthquake region, you have tsunamis that get uh, piled into that natural disaster um, consideration. Um, and it's important to be aware of the risks within your region and then prepare for them accordingly so that you can ensure the safety of your athletes and their families. So those are just some really broad topics as to the different kinds of um, emergencies that you might experience um, you know, while you're coaching or managing or traveling with your sports association. So how do we prepare for those? Um, this. Uh, the list of emergencies that we've just gone through is certainly not exhausted and exhaustive, and you can um, go into each one in a lot more detail and be very much more specific um, into each one, you know, preparing for fires, preparing for flooding, preparing for earthquakes, tornadoes, all of the above. Um, but it gives you a good idea of the variety that can impact your sports association and your athletes, and then it gives you an opportunity to prepare. So it is important, though, to remember that you can never identify every possible 
possible emergency or potential emergency. You just need to think beyond the obvious to identify the potential risks and then their ripple effects. So one way to streamline your planning is to get the basics together and then adjust for each scenario on the fly. And that's really where individual training and practice can come into play as well. So for example, super general, if one of your athletes is injured, so we're going kind of back to that medical um, emergency or that sports injury, um, rather than trying to predict specifically for you know, a broken bone versus a sprained ankle versus a concussion, consider these pieces and then build around them. Um, consider how the athlete's teammates will react, especially if you're coaching kids. Um, you know, the younger children are, um, there can be a, a tendency for a sort of added panic or lack of understanding. So keep that in mind, the age group that you're coaching or working with. Um, consider if any parents will get, will get involved. Um, if parents are there on the sidelines watching a game or even watching a practice, are they likely to jump in? Uh, if they have training, are you going to allow them to support your coaching or training staff um, with support for that child? If they, or are you going to ask them to step aside and let you do your work? And also, consider how quickly you can summon medical assistance if you need to. So that goes back to, do you have a team doctor um, or nurse on hand? Um, are you close to an emergency room where you could uh, potentially drive an athlete, or are you going to have to call an ambulance? So all of those pieces um, kind of give you a really good framework to start, and then you can build around each of those. And so with that in mind, let's get started on how you can actually really specifically prepare for emergencies in support, in sports. Um, in addition to any formal first aid training, the best way to prepare yourself, your athletes, and your team is actually with an emergency action plan. Every team or sport, and or sport I should say, will have key differences for several things. So whether it's venues, um, the, your location, and that's location for the team, generally location where in the world you, you happen to be, your team and your staff comp composition, and also the sport itself. So keep those in, in mind that your emergency action plan is going to be your roadmap to handling any emergency. It's where you're going to keep your core processes, your core bits of information, and then as I said, using that specific training um, and knowledge, um, then you can adjust as you go. So where do we start with that? You start by identifying all possible emergencies. So just a quick reminder is the, the ones that we went over. And again, feel free to add, remove, um, or adjust as you see fit. So these are the categories. And of course, there's going to be um, subcategories that fall under these. So medical emergencies like broken bones or concussions, localized emergencies like a fire or a flood in the arena or the community center or the, the field or the pitch that you're playing on. Severe weather, like a blizzard or heavy rainfall, is that going to impact where you are? Is that going to cause power outages? Is that going to make play impossible? And then widespread disasters like earthquakes or tornadoes. What happens if one occurs like, during a practice or during a game? Um, and what are you going to do um, to manage that? From there, you'll need to identify how your venue will impact your response. And this goes for the facility where you most regularly train and host your home games, competitions, or tournaments. So you're going to have your, your main um, venue priorities and information. And then, as we mentioned earlier, you should also have a team-focused emergency plan for those times you're visiting another team or you're perhaps taking part in an off-site tournament. Um, and this is, again, where you can connect with facility managers to help prepare your team. Um, you might get, uh, you know, I don't know, building layout, um, know where the fire exits are, know what their processes are for an emergency, and then how you can slot into them the expectations for you as a coach, the expectations for your players and, and family members. Um, so make that more of a collaborative effort for that. And as I said, that's an emergency plan that goes with you more as a team based on where you're going to be visiting. And whether you're sticking to home or you're traveling away, include directions to any venue that you might attend and share them with your coaching staff, share them with your athletes if they're older or, and getting themselves to the venue, or share them with families as well, um, so that everyone knows where to go um, and can do so efficiently and quickly, especially in an emergency. If you've got um, a, a parent who's not at training, um, and this is either a new training facility or you're doing it at a, an off-site location, they can get to their child um, as quickly as possible, and they don't need to worry about um, you know, wondering about Google Maps and whether they're finding the right place. And also, in this case, consider including um, actual evacuation plans for these venues as well, so that you and your athletes always know how to quickly and safely leave a building if you need to, and also how to ensure that everyone is accounted for once you're out. Again, whether that's your home facilities or away, or as I said, somewhere in, in the middle. Create a communication plan. 
This will determine how you'll notify an athlete's emergency contact person, whether it's a parent, guardian, or alternate contact, in the event of any kind of emergency, having a way to communicate with them as quickly and efficiently as possible is key to ensuring your player's safety. So don't forget to include a process um, for how you're going to notify anyone who might not be in the arena with you or might not be on the pitch with you. For example, if it's a training, uh, you might find that parents just drop their kids off um, or you have one parent who's responsible for a number of kids or carpooling together. Um, so make sure that you have a really solid, clear process in place to uh, notify those parents who might not literally be there when that emergency takes place. And make sure you test this plan regularly. Um, that helps you identify gaps and it, makes, it gives you an opportunity to, um, to make improvements before you need to actually use this plan in an emergency. It gives you a, an opportunity to, to test things in a much less stressful environment um, so that when the stressful occasion occurs, you can literally just go into autopilot and, and make sure that you're just following the, the different steps of your plan that you've already determined. Next, assign team staff to emergency roles. Don't feel that you have to take on all of those roles specifically yourself. Um, that's the whole point of, of a team in general is to, uh, is to, to share the responsibilities um, and make sure that everybody's doing their part. So if you can assign people to each of the roles needed to handle an emergency and make sure that their names, their other key information like contact telephone numbers or email addresses are included in your plan and that they're easy to find when needed. So I don't know if you're going to send out like a single email that says, you know, in the case of an emergency, here are all of your important people, bookmark this, or if you have it on a website, I'm sending people the link. Um, and some rules to consider, um, for example, who calls 911 if medical support is needed? That's especially important if, for example, you have to administer CPR to an athlete. Um, you can focus on CPR where you know, person A can be responsible for, for calling medical services. And on that note, Perhaps you want to identify who administers interim first aid or support until paramedics arrive. Uh, if you have someone who either is um, more seasoned in their first aid training um, or you have someone who um, maybe is more confident um, in their CPR skills, for example, um, you could assign them to be uh, that person. And then, of course, you're going to make sure, want to make sure that you have a backup for all of these roles as well. Um, going back to that communications piece, who is responsible for notifying parents or guardians, including those who are absent from training um, or a game? Are you going to assign somebody to get on the phone and make all the phone calls um, versus somebody else assigned to send emails or texts? Or are you going to have one person do all of that? And then, um, you know, a key part of uh, injury or, or emergency reporting is who's responsible for recording and reporting that incident? Um, so whether it's, uh, you know, a sports or a team-based emergency. Um, many different sports associations have governing bodies that they have to submit injury reports to. So again, are you going to have one person who is responsible for that? Next are emergency supplies. So document those emergency supplies. So first aid kits are probably going to be the most common thing when it comes to sports. But if you have emergency supply kits, for example, you know, if you have to shelter in place in your venue, do you have supplies and kits for that? Um, do you have any additional equipment that you may need to support an athlete in an emergency? So it's important to list where these items are stored and make sure that all staff are kept up to date on this so that new, new staff coming in know where everything is kept. If you've had to move anything for any reason, um, then people know uh, where the new location is. It's important to regularly check and restock your kits to replenish any of the expired or items that have been used. Um, you know, I don't know if somebody's uh, cut themselves and you know you've not replaced your bandages or your band aids for a while. Um, then it's a good idea to get in there, and make sure, make sure they're fresh, um, make sure that any items that do have an expiry date on them are replaced. Um, on or before their expiry date. Um, and also it's a chance to actually add any new items that you might discover a need for, either as athletes join your team or even as um, coaching or training staff come and go as well. Uh, there might be some items that you want to include in there that are very specific to certain allergies, um, for example, or certain uh, medical conditions too. And make sure that the appropriate staff know how to use the items in your kit. A lot of sports associations or coaching and team staff tend to be very tight-knit and small, so it might even be a good idea to have everybody take a quick training course on how to use things like EpiPens or um, how to operate an asthma inhaler. Um, those things might seem really simple, um, but training always helps just take away that element of stress and, and the unknown, um, and it means that you can just act as quickly as you need to um, to support your, your players. And 
as this audience will know better than anyone, regular practice and training is really important. Um, coaching staff are often required to have formal first aid and CPR training based on the nature of their role um, and um, you know what it is that they're doing. Um, those skills are regularly revised. Usually every couple years or so, you're required to recertify uh, in one or both of those um, skills, which is great. It ensures that those there you're kept up to date um, and that you are aware of any new developments or new skills or new additions to that training um, that might come up in between um, your certification times. Coaches can also get advice from other coaches. Uh, team staff can get advice from other team staff. Again, making that collaborative environment and sharing information based on experience can actually be a really huge benefit to everyone. You might even want to include additional training, so things that are specific to emergency preparedness planning, um, or even additionally to concussion awareness, um, so that you can help yourself recognize the symptoms of a concussed athlete. Um, with much more education and information coming out about concussion management, um, this is a really valuable uh, piece of learning for, for absolutely anyone on the team, is to be able to recognize those concussion symptoms right away and then um, act appropriately and accordingly. And regularly practicing your training overall, whatever it is, as I said, whether it's concussion management, whether it's first aid, whether it's CPR, whether it's your emergency plans, whether it's drills, um, it just helps your coaching staff better respond quickly and efficiently in an emergency, and it ensures that they're always up to date with the latest knowledge and also certifications that might be applicable to your, your sport as well. And finally, just some additional items to consider uh, within your emergency action plan. Um, access to telephones. Um, most of us now have at least a cell phone or a smartphone on us all the time. Um, but I know that some of us can be, uh, you know, we're using our devices all the time and there's nothing worse than coming to use your cell phone and you realize that the battery is, you know, on its last legs. You've got 5% left and you just need to turn your phone off to save it so you can make sure you get home. So making sure that your cell phone um, at the very least always has a good charge or you have access to charge it, um, you know, until you need to use it or even considering having a spare battery pack um, or, or charging option um, as well is great. Make sure you have a list of emergency phone numbers for home and away competitions. So yeah, that could just be specific to your um, coaching staff and your team staff um, and you know who to contact in an emergency. But it might be something else. Maybe there is um, a medical facility or a uh, medical professional within uh, the away venue that you're going to or your venue, making sure that you have the phone number for that, the front desk emergency services, non-emergency services, where it's not an emergency, but you still need, I don't know, the police to show up, for example. Um, so knowing the difference between those versus dialing 911. Um, and also including athlete and personnel information too. Injuries are not necessarily uh, specific to the athletes, although the chances of those being that they're playing are going to be a little high. But you want to make sure that you have um, key information for your coaching staff as well. Making sure that you have their profile form, so you know, information about them, name, address, birth date, etc., uh, phone number, um, as well as emergency contacts for everyone, and also medical information too. And make sure this is easily accessible in an emergency. Give you a quick hint here is that EPACT can actually help you with that. That is a whole load of information um, about the different emergencies in, in COVID and how to make sure that you have a plan um, to prepare, respond, and recover from the emergencies. As well, you're a trusted friend, fire, and energy, and the view of your athletes. So it's essential to consider potential emergency situations that you might face and have an action plan to respond. I hope you found our webinar and that you have a few ideas to share with your staff so that you can work to make your emergency preparedness plans. If at any time you have any questions or you'd like to learn more about how EPACT can support your sports association and your athletes, you can visit our website at www.epactnetwork.com or you can reach out to our sales team by phone or email at your convenience and that information is on the screen now. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again soon.